You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. My my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and any other places where you get your podcast. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And just as an additional note, I like to let my listeners and viewers know I do gratitude keynote speaking as well as gratitude coaching. And you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or as you can see on the video, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. So let me get on with the show and introduce my guest. Always the highlight of my weekly show is my guest. No exception this week. Jane Duncan Rogers, three years after Jane Duncan Rogers' husband died, She published Gifted by Grief, and readers' response to this book led to her founding, Before I Go Solutions. This social enterprise trains people to become end-of-life plan facilitators, helping others in later life to prepare well for a good death. They also provide products and online programs for those wishing to create comprehensive end-of-life plans. Jane is also an author in Before I Go, The Essential Guide to Creating a Good End-of-Life Plan, and the creator of the End-of-Life Planning Cards, and has also done a TEDx talk, How to Do a Good Death. Jane, welcome, welcome to the program. Hi, hi. Lovely to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you. That's such a great word. I have another friend in, in the UK. Lovely. I love that word. So <laughs> you have some really interesting things that we're going to want to talk about that I think will be very valuable to the listeners and viewers. But I always kind of start out with just to get a context. Well, first of all, tell the viewers, my first question is always the same. How did you and I meet? Well, yeah. How did we meet? I was Uh, recommended to you by a mutual friend, um, a mutual contact, I should say. And so, of course, I reached out to you because I was interested. I looked at that Gratitude Guy podcast. I I looked at your website. I listened to it. I thought, this guy is on my wavelength. I need to talk to him. And and then we discovered that we had another mutual friend in common, didn't we, Nancy? That's right. I think our paths were destined to cross. <laughs> I, I think you're exactly right. I think the word is serendipitous. And it's just, it's, it's always interesting. I think I met, uh, mentioned to you when we met now, just, it's amazing. You can meet one person and that branches out like the, the branches on a tree to all these other people. And it's really, really cool. So, but to give, to give the viewers and listeners a context before, because I really want to talk about your book and what you've done in this end of life and, and so on. That's just so fascinating to me uh, before I go solutions and so on. But let's walk back a little bit or go back to maybe not, you know, high school, but maybe college age and kind of growing up and talk a little bit about your journey, how it kind of started out and then ultimately how you got here. Sure. Well, I can remember when I was 16 thinking, I want to know what makes people tick. And that propelled me into studying psychology at university. Uh, I didn't, I can't honestly say that studying psychology enabled me to understand what made people tick. And I don't even know if I know right now, but it certainly led me on a path of uh, exploration, let's call it that, and meditation. I was also um, a a student of uh, meditation at that time as well. And my work led me into working in the uh, um, training in those days it was called personnel you know personnel management that's what I trained in originally and I but at the same time I was really interested in personal growth and I was a follower of Louise L. Hay author of You Can Heal Your Life which some of your listeners will know about and I ended up training with her personally in 1990 um, on what turned out to be the very last training that she did that she personally did and that authorized me to be a You Can Heal Your Life study group leader. And I was the first one in, the, in Europe. 
So I came back uh, to at that time I was living in England and uh, I plucked up my courage and I started running groups based on You Can Heal Your Life. And I got into uh, counseling, I would say, one to one counseling because people came to my groups and they said, can I do one to one work with you? So I, being me, I said yes having not had a clue how to do it, but I always say yes, if I feel motivated to, and then I find out how to do it afterwards. So I said yes, and then I thought I better get some training in this. And that's what led me into my counseling training. Um, and then I, by this time I was now self-employed and um, gosh, yeah, I'm cutting out quite a lot here, but basically I uh, carried on being a self-employed counselor, psychotherapist, that sort of thing, running groups. I wrote a book, way back then this is way before the internet is not in print anymore but I loved, loved writing from that time and um, I when we moved to the north of Scotland which is where I am now which is there's not very many people up here and at that point this was in 2007 and I realized I, I'd better go online I better start doing things online because there's not so many people here we're not in a city or anything not even near it so that's what I started doing. And I started coaching as well as counseling. Um, and, and then my husband got diagnosed with stomach cancer. That was in 2010. And that was completely out of the blue. And you know, when you get a diagnosis or something like that, it stops you in your tracks, which is exactly what happened. Um, and that year, that the year of the lead up to him actually dying which was about 14 months later and then the year after that constituted my book gifted by grief now i knew that i would always write about this because i i loved writing i'd already been re uh, writing a blog and i knew that i would need to write to help me process this huge event um I didn't expect any of the things that came out of it and no idea at all. I thought I would just get maybe a few more counseling clients, you know, um, who, who, who needed to work with bereavement, bereaved people. But, and, and that did happen, but um, yeah, <laughs> what actually happened was that I published this book um, and people responded to, the chapter in it that I had written about the questions that I'd asked my husband before he died. Now, those questions were really practical ones, things like, what kind of coffin do you want? How do you want your body dressed? What are your passwords? When should I sell the car? Really, really specific things. And they had been sent to us by a friend and she'd sent that email to us three times because we didn't want to look at those questions. But anyway, we eventually we did. And funnily enough, we had actually a good time talking about it. It was like an end, even though the subject was his end of life. We it felt like a project that we were doing together and we'd been really good at doing projects together, renovating houses and things like that. And, and that's what it felt like. So it was really actually OK, more than OK. We were incredibly loving and intimate and close together, you know, as a result of these conversations. Anyway, um, that is the chapter that readers responded to when I published Gifted by Grief. And they wanted to answer these questions, too. And uh, after about a week of, I don't know, eight to ten people saying the same thing to me, I thought, oh, all right, then maybe I need to put together a workshop, which, of course, I was used to doing based on these questions. And that's how it started. And that was in January 2017. And um, we've carried on going since then. And Jane, that's it's so interesting. The there's something about the you mentioned early on. I want to know what made what made people tick. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a great question. And I know uh, when I was 24, it, it just I'll remember very clearly is I remember asking myself after uh, college, university, as they say in the in Europe, but um, what what's my point now what am I doing you know I've gotten I got married I had high school junior high high school college graduated had a job what am I supposed to do now and so I think it's really neat when you ask yourself questions like that but speaking of questions and and it really is fascinating about gifted by grief what is your take on 
Is it just because it's so uncomfortable for people to talk about death that they don't ask those questions? Because you mentioned that chapter, which is really interesting. What kind of coffin do you want? How do you want to be dressed? And I'm sure there's more questions, of course. Is it just the uncomfortableness about that that, me, that makes people not want to talk about it, do you think? Well, that's one aspect of it, definitely. Um, people are, are afraid, generally speaking, of um, the fact that we die, you know, that yeah. nobody really wants to admit that we die and that it is a normal part of life. Right. Even yeah. in still in the midst of the pandemic, for some people, even in the aftermath of the pandemic, it's like it's still it, it's less of a taboo topic than it was, but it still is to some degree. But I think there's also um, people are. Um, um, oh, what's the word? I've forgotten the word. They're superstitious. That's it. They're superstitious. They think that if I think about this, it'll it'll happen. Mm. And um, it's not. It doesn't work quite like that. But that's another valid reason. And also, they don't want to offend people. Mm. So uh, I often find that adult children don't want to mention this to their elderly parents because they're they're afraid that their parents will think that they want to bump them off or something which of yeah. course is not true but and then it's not uncommon for me to hear that from the adult child and then they do pluck up their courage with our support and they go and speak to their parents only to discover that the parents have been worrying about the same thing wanting to bring it up but not knowing how to do it that's not an uncommon situation but we don't want to offend people. So that's another reason. And, you know, we, we can see that all the time with people when you're bereaved and or when you know somebody who's bereaved, but you feel awkward around them. So you avoid them or you try not to say anything or you don't know what to say. So you don't say anything at all or you do say something and then you, you feel clumsy with it. You know, it's like, oh, it's a bit of a mind, minefield, really. Yeah. So, yeah, there's quite a lot of reasons. Well, and that's a, a very interesting point, too. And, and I don't know if I mentioned it when we met, but having lost um, kind of in order my mother when I was in my 20s, my father, and then later my wife, I was kind of one of the key people uh, orchestrating each of those burial services and so forth. And so you've kind of reminded me and touched on some things that I haven't thought about in a while that are so interesting. And one of them is, is that I'm just so interested in the fact that people don't know what to say. So yeah. they either don't say anything, they avoid the subject, they say inappropriate things or whatever it might be. And it's not even, in my opinion, being mad at them. I just feel sorry for them because they don't know what to say. And I, I'm, I'm mindful of a story that um, a good friend of mine told me about a friend that he had who had lost his son. And when the friend was visiting this friend of my, my buddy, the picture of his son was on the mantle. And he said, the friend came over and said, gosh, whatever his name was, Josh, such a handsome young man. He died when he was like 18. And the father looked at my friend and just said, thank you for saying that. Most people act like he never existed, you yeah. know, and, they, and people want to talk about it. So I think it's interesting. So I want to come back to something you said about after stomach cancer and then your husband passed away. When you had those conversations, uh, what kind of coffin, how do you want to be dressed? Typically, you don't have that conversation with a person because they've passed on. And this is what is so kind of groundbreaking about what you're talking about, which I think is so cool. There, there must have been some things along the way that your husband said that probably surprised you that knowing typically you would have made those decisions on your own. But now yeah. you're, you're having this and you said you were very good at projects. What were some of those examples of things that you went, oh, that kind of maybe took you back or maybe gave you a different view? Well, I'll tell you, when I asked him that question, how do you want your body to be dressed? I would never have guessed what his answer would be mm -hmm. because he said he wanted to be dressed in his dressing gown. Now, as soon as I, as soon as he said that, I knew why, because I made him that dressing gown and he really loved it. Oh, but I, wouldn't, I would not have thought of that. Now, here's a wonderful thing. When the funeral director came to the house, uh, however many days after it was that he died, um, he asked me, how do you want his body dressed? And I was able to say. Now, it felt so good to be able to tell that man what Philip had told me. I had no idea that I would get some tiny solace out of being able to communicate Philip's wishes to the funeral director because, you know, otherwise I would have been just guessing. And that would have been okay, probably, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't have given me the good feeling. It, I mean, good feeling relative, okay, because it was a horrible situation, obviously, but the relatively good feeling to know that I was carrying out what Philip had said 
to me that he wanted and also that he knew that I was going to say that and that that was really really good it was great actually yeah, yeah. that's really and you mentioned uh when you were talking about Philip too the uh, people are afraid about death and I've noticed that it, it's always interested me I've this occurred to me many times throughout my life that I've known some people 30 40 <clears throat> 50 years and we've never really had a conversation about where do you think you go when you die what is your you know there's people that think you never wake up there's people that think they're reincarnated they think they go to heaven you know walk down the bright tunnel with the bright lights or what have you so it's just been sort of taboo but uh what I'm really curious especially from your research and the things that you've done is that what what is it about makes people so afraid of death I mean maybe the unknown but and what can be done to kind of uh make that a little bit easier thing to handle yeah, well, it's, it's, it's interesting this, isn't it? I mean, it is afraid of the unknown. Of course it is, you know, um, because we don't know for sure what is actually going to happen to us. Even if you've had a near-death experience, you, you don't know for sure that the same thing is going to happen. Although I've never had one, so I can't authentically speak like that. But um, I think that um, I've now forgotten the question. What was the question again? Sorry, oh, about what, what can be done to kind of maybe help people oh, yeah. not be so afraid or whatever. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, I, I, addressing these practical issues helps. I don't exactly mm -hmm. know why that is, but I've heard that from more than one person when they plucked up their courage to actually turn around and face their fear and done it in a, a very practical way because all of these questions are practical. There is no, you know, we, I know there's the whole emotional and spiritual side of things, but, and I'm interested in that personally, but we don't offer that in our work, in my work. We offer the container that allows people to answer the specific um, practical questions. And there's something about doing that, that frees people up from feeling so afraid of whatever it is that they're afraid of. It, it's almost like, when you're willing to take control about the things that you can take control of around the end, which, you know, we're not in control of when it's actually going to happen or how it's actually going to happen, but we can control our ideal situation, let's say. And there's quite a lot we can control, for example, around our funeral and our will and um, the, um, uh, the other aspects of a good end of life plan. Right. And, you know, I, I was thinking back on the friends that I've lost and, I mentioned my mom and dad and my wife and and but certainly other people too and i think kind of how the person passes away uh, i had a friend that died of a uh, fraternity brother good friend that died of uh, lou gehrig's disease and mm -hmm. als and boy talk about not having any control when at one point couldn't move one leg the other leg one arm and then eventually couldn't move at all and just having that control i can see how that would really kind of make a difference and with in the case of with you with philip was did you notice that I mean I just can't imagine that it wouldn't it wouldn't have been a better experience if it's possible to say that about passing on but what you two went through together you must have really witnessed some neat things chatting with him as it got down the down the down the path if you will yeah no I understand yes well you know I didn't know any of the stuff that I know now and if I wish that I had known more then because I would have asked him different questions as well. Oh. However, however, having said that, there was still loads that we were able to discuss, but he basically was, um, he was afraid of dying. He didn't want to die. He felt like he was 65 when he was diagnosed, died a year later, and he felt like it was too young. He'd had, he had more to do in life, which is completely understandable, especially at that right. age. Um, but towards the end, he told me that he felt like he had made peace with not knowing. Now that was a big deal for him because he was quite an intellectual guy and he really liked to know stuff. You know, he was like, you're walking Google, that sort of thing. No. And uh, uh, yeah, it used to really irritate me sometimes, but anyway, uh, he was, for, so for him to be able to say that he was okay with not knowing, and this was like maybe two or three days before he actually died, that was wonderful because he, it was clear that he was still processing the fact that he was coming towards the end and yeah. and and therefore was in the end able to die peacefully i think peacefully such a such a great way if there's such a great way in that case 
you know, mm-hmm. my whole theme and topic is gratitude. And, and how did gratitude play a part on your part or on Philip's part, if you will, where I talk about it still is tough as much as this is end of life. We're talking about really focusing on your blessings and abundance and not worrying about what you don't have. How is that was a factor for you too? Well, in the last year, I would say that we were married 20 years. And in that last year, I would say that was probably the best year of our marriage, even more so than right at the beginning when we were totally madly in love. Wow. And I think that a large part of that was because of appreciating what we had and being grateful for what we did have and not focusing on what we didn't have or what we weren't going to have. So that was very, very important. Um, And And that really contributed to us having an amazing last year, actually. So in a funny sort of way, and we did talk about this, we were even able to say that we could be grateful for the cancer coming to visit, even though we knew it was going to kill him. I mean, we probably wouldn't have said that to anybody who might not already understand, but Mm -hmm. he and I did understand that. And also, I had the same thing after after he died not immediately after he died but maybe two to three years after he died and this was why I was able to call my first book gifted by grief because I ended up writing at the end of that book I ended up writing that I felt grateful for both his life and his death because of what I had learned as a result and I, I still feel like that incredibly grateful for both you know and, and you know too there's something about I always think about I mentioned many times in my talks about don't compare yourself to other people. Comparison is the thief of joy. But sometimes there can be a value in comparison when seeing that somebody else has it worse off than you. And for instance, you mentioned within the last few days of Philip's life and you were talking and then he died peacefully and so forth. And and then there's there's many ways to die, of course. And some of them aren't peaceful and some of them are horrific and different things. And so in a sense, I just think that's so neat. That's once again, framing it on the positives, if you will, instead of the negatives. And People will ask me, especially when I do my talking about gratitude, is they almost challenge me, well, what's good about this? What's good about that? And even the pandemic. And I said, look at all these things that the technology, I said, I'm I'm sitting, I I could be at Starbucks with Jane, you know, you look like you're three or four feet away and we're halfway around the world, you know, in Mm -hmm. Scotland and and in Seattle and so forth. And so there's all these things and whoever thought we'd get a vaccine that fast that would help people and so on. So there's many, many things. So it does kind of depend on how you look at it. So, uh, which is important. So that's, that's, that's kind of a neat thing. And, And I want to move into a little bit about the book before I go, the essential guide to creating a good end of life plan. Talk a little bit about that and maybe some of the highlights or the, the outline or the bullet points or whatever you, however you'd like to describe it, that would be valuable to people. Sure. Well, the book is written in two halves. So the first half is the background thinking that you need to uh, consider in order to be able to think about having a good end of life in the first place, which is ideally what we all want. Um, And then the second half goes into much more specifics about the different parts of an end of life plan and what are the kinds of questions that you need to ask yourself. So, for example, everybody knows about wills and powers of attorney and that sort of thing. Not everybody has them yet, but they know that they should should have them. So there is a uh, there is a chapter about that, obviously, and the reasons why you should do it, which, you know, probably is not the most interesting chapter because people think they know about that. Mm -hmm. But then there's um, then there's uh, the we we look at how to have. Um, how to start conversations around this subject really important that Mm -hmm. and I would say there's three c's to remember when you want to start a conversation about this one is that you need courage in the first place because you're going to be talking about something that most people don't talk about the second is you need a context this is incredibly important you can't just come down to you know breakfast in the morning and say um what kind of clothes do you want to have when you die, you know, right. or you know, who right. do you want to have at your funeral sort of thing? It doesn't work. Don't right. even bother trying it. Right. What you need to have is a context. And, and that might be something like um, you, uh, maybe you did hear that somebody on the radio locally had died and that made you think about your own funeral then, and you say all that, then you've got a context. Um, and then the third C is, um, I call it having a a chat, a death chat. Mm. And I call it a chat because people think that you have to be all sort of somber and um, terribly, you know, um, 
respectful and it's all a bit dark actually it doesn't have to be like that at all you can be quite not not light-hearted but you can be quite light about all this and that is what I bring to it um and that's how I've written the book as well by the way everything that I write is how I speak so if you like this then you might like the book but um so we cover so we cover yeah we cover the legals we cover the funeral stuff obviously because those are the things that people know about they don't always know about your digital life now that's increasingly mm -hmm. important because you will still be alive online unless you take care of it beforehand now that all for example the different social media platforms have have ways for you as when you're alive to appoint um they call it different things, but a memorial contact or some, somebody like that who is authorized to do whatever it is that you want done with your account um, when you're no longer there. But it has to be set up in advance. Otherwise, it's really difficult because there are privacy laws, you know, understandably. Right. So that's a whole other area. We also look at the whole what goes on in the household. So this includes your finances, which you're, obviously people know about finances, but it includes uh, something that some of your listeners might have heard of, which is death cleaning. But if you've never heard of that before, don't worry about it. It just means decluttering towards the later end of your life. Really important, because if you look around your room right now, you'll see that there's loads of stuff. And somebody's going to have to deal with that stuff once you're no, no longer here. You can make it a lot easier for them. Yeah. So we talk about that as well and how to actually do that and, and, and not get overwhelmed. It's very important. In fact, I've got a whole chapter about lots of obstacles. But um, so what else? We talk about advanced care planning. Well, that's the official term. I call it last day's wishes. How do you actually want the end of your life to be? Now, we don't know, but. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to take us. We just know that it is going to happen. And but what works while you're alive is to have put down in writing your ideal scenario, because you don't know that you're not going to get it and that you're more likely to get it. And statistics are shown this as well if something is written down. So, for example, if your preference would be to die at home or to die in a hospice, then that's very, very helpful if towards the end of your life, you can't actually speak for yourself for whatever reason. Maybe you've had a stroke or you're, um, you're in a coma or you're just not understanding things in the way that you um, normally would have done. But if it's all written down and somebody is able to represent you, ideally your healthcare power of attorney, then it makes it much easier and much more likely that you'll get what you want as well. Yeah, and that's and that's a good point. And I still think as I'm taking notes on an eight and a half by yellow pad, as I always do, it's interesting with all the electronic technology and you can speak into things and it types it and so forth. Uh, I always say there's still nothing quite like writing it down in the gratitude journal. There's a comment right at the beginning that says if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. And there's something about it. And I recently took the it happened to be a golden rod, green, yellow form about end of life what I want done instructions. And I told both my sons, my doctor gave it to me about not to revive me if I'm brain dead and things like that. And uh, I put it in a plastic thing in the freezer, you know, and, yeah. and the idea being is they know where it is. And if there was a fire, it wouldn't burn down. So it'd be in the freezer in a plastic bag and so forth. So, but you mentioned coming back to a couple of things, the digital life, I think is something that I know a lot of people, myself included, wouldn't necessarily think about no. and all that. And, and I don't think about it until I get a friend request from somebody I know who's dead. You yeah, know, and I just exactly. think that's kind of odd. And I've had that happen on Facebook. I've had it happen in LinkedIn and in different things like that. So that's those are, again, some really good reminders. And, and, and another one that hits me is I think of the first three deaths of in my life that were two of the three were unexpected, my father and my wife. And when you mentioned decluttering, first of all, decluttering, I think is a great thing to do just period throughout yeah. your life, once a week, yeah. once a month, once a year, whatever, we all accumulate so much junk and so forth. But in the case of the, the deaths that were sudden, uh, for me, and I happen to be kind of, of the kids was kind of the leader, I was the one charged with cleaning out everything. And it's really 
not fun. It no. sounds right to say it. And you're going through all their stuff. So to have that all done ahead of time uh, would really be neat. And, and, but you, you said something else too, that I wanted to make sure I got to wrap up here in about five minutes, but before, before we end is some things that you know now and, and around that you would do, what's some of the things that now that since the book, since Philip's passing that you maybe knowing what you know now might do a little bit differently? Well, one of the things that I would ask somebody who had a terminal diagnosis or was coming towards the end of what is, um, and this is one of the things that I wish that I'd asked Philip was, what are your goals right now? What is it that you want to achieve, if anything, in these last however long it is? Because that's what I wanted to facilitate. Now, I don't remember asking that in that way. And but I think that if I had, um, I think that I would been I would have been facilitating that to happen if I could have done. And, and you hear about this, you know, often when people say what their last wish is, or sometimes, you know, to go and have a go and meet a particular person or to see their grandchild one last time or to just sit outside in the sunshine and listen to the birds. It doesn't matter what it is. What matters is that the person speaking has acknowledge that they they may want something and maybe they can fulfill that happening so that yeah that would have been great that's really that's really now i was thinking too that some of the things that you mentioned to um we talk about people are afraid of death and they don't want to offend people and even mm -hmm. which leads to how to start a conversation and i really like the three c's the courage the context and the chat and mm -hmm. just some of those, and I always think that what's interesting, I, I put that in the same category as difficult conversations. And I've heard all sorts of, there was a book, Fierce Conversations, and a lot of things around conversation. And I maintain, and you mentioned that the best relationship or the best year was your last year with Philip. And after being madly in love 20 years ago and going through a 20 year uh, lifespan of a marriage. And my guess is that in most cases where those marriages and relationships are that good, it's a lot of it, if not 90% is about the conversation that you have with oh, that person. Can you communicate? And the word communicate gets, I think it's overused, but, but I think that, you know, that it comes back to where if you just take that moment and have that, and, and I love the part about the context and just drop it, drop them on, on, uh, on breakfast. It kind of reminds me of my very first marriage where I, I, we had this agreement once a year, we'd sit down maybe twice a year and say, tell me something that bothers me, that bothers you that I do. And the agreement is, is I will work on it, but I can't get mad at you. And it was just one of those ways to, to just make the marriage better. And yeah. okay, I'll tell you what it is, the way you do so-and-so, okay, now it's your turn. And you, and so any of those things where you address the difficult conversations and so forth, but, um, and then just what you just mentioned too, about what are your goals I think mm -hmm. that's that's really neat. I mean, that's a good question a lot of the time in different situations. And here we've got X number of months left or what do you want to accomplish or or do or, you know, that for some reason, I always think when people have a terminal illness, one of the first things they think they want to travel. Uh, and mm -hmm. then there's other people that traveling is and they want to be in their own home in their own bed with their own chest of drawers or whatever it might be. Yeah. So, um, but that's that's so interesting though. And I think that, this and, and the other thing you another thing that you said is that I'm really happy to hear that about Philip when he didn't want to die he had a lot more to accomplish uh, but then kind of had made peace and what do you think it was about that maybe it was the conversations that had him get to that level of making peace with him near the end yeah interesting well he was uh he he was a great one for analyzing and so I think his even though he was so seriously ill, he was still processing and analyzing things even, even in those days, even in those last few days. And, um, you know, one of the things that happened was that by the time he was told there was nothing more that could be done, and we discussed him coming home, knowing that he would be coming home to die, he was too ill to be moved. So oh. we looked at each other and I said to him, look, you know, it doesn't matter because home is where we are. And that was so true. You know, it's not about the form. It's about the essence. And that's what we were communicating to each other mm -hmm. in that moment. So as I say that, I can still remember the look in his eyes. It's beautiful. And I um, can't remember why I'm telling you that now, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, as the surviving spouse is the person that's still here, 
what if you look back on it, what was Jane's best coping mechanism that helped you the most most through all of that? Oh, undoubtedly, I knew from my Louise Hay training that what you feel, you can heal. That was one of her quotes. Mm. And I also knew because grief, when grief hits you like this, when somebody very close to you has died, as you'll know, it, it's a very bumpy journey indeed. And I just knew that I had to not, um, I had to feel my feelings, just let them be there, whatever they were. God, it was painful, I can tell you, really painful. However, I worked out that if I, if when a feeling came to visit me that I didn't want to have, like pain or anger or rage or fear or any of the ones that we don't like, if I actually opened the front door of my house, so to speak, and open the windows and let it come in. And I opened the back door and the back windows as well so that the feeling could come in, it could be there for a bit and then it could easily go. Mm. Then actually that was the way that I was going to be able to get through this feeling the best. And I knew I had to go through it. I knew I had to let that come into my house, so to speak. Because if I tried to do what most people do, which is shut the door, close the curtains, batten down the hatches, whatever it is, it doesn't go away. It just lurks around in the garden and it finds a way into the house in, in, a, in a more insidious way and causes trouble. So that's absolutely the most important. I call it front door, back door thinking because you have to open the doors to keep, to allow the feelings to be there. And it's jolly painful, but it's the best way to get through it that I know of. That's a great analogy. And I can, when you were saying that, I can visualize whether it's a dark gray murky cloud or something coming in through the front door and the windows yeah. into the house and it's there for a while and then it gets processed yeah. and gets sent out the back door, the back windows. And it, it reminds me of something that was in a different context with a, a customer that was upset, but the person made the analogy, which I really liked. It's like uh, you let a balloon blow up and somebody gets madder and madder and madder and the balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You can't just come up and pop the balloon. You have to let them talk and then slowly let as they talk uh, all the air out of the balloon or back down to normal. And the person after that would say, gosh, I feel so much better. Thank you for listening to me. And, That's right. I mean, and yet I've still never quite gotten an answer to why is it if I'm sitting there, whether you and I are tens of thousands of miles apart or at Starbucks. And if Jane is listening to David and I'm, you and I are talking, why that's so effective, even if you say nothing, as opposed to me just talking to the wall, it's just not the same. <laughs> there has to be a human being on the other end of the connection that just might smile and kind of nod and so forth. But yeah, uh, well, listen, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. And, and I appreciate all that you've done and all that you've learned and all that you're um, passing on to other people. And I will end with my last question, which is always the same. And that is, if you can only pick one thing, what is Jane Duncan Rogers know today that you would have liked to know at 18 that would have helped you? <laughs> well, I think you might have asked me this before and I've forgotten what the answer was. So That's, That's okay, we'll get a new one. <laughs> spontaneously, I would have liked to have known that it was all gonna be okay and I didn't need to worry. <laughs> I was quite anxious when I was younger and I can still fall into that now but you know it it does turn out all right even when there are disasters like my husband dying you know I mean I think I told you earlier that I have since got married again to a man who That's his right. wife had also died and when we married we had our the pictures of our dead spouses with us because we recognized that we wouldn't have met and be so in love now without the, the fact that our previous loves had died. I mean, you know, right. it's ironic, isn't it? it but is. it, it's wonderful. So, yeah, it, things work out. Yeah. Things work out. And, and it's, such a, it's such a good point. I'm always, I always like to wrap up on that question. And I've gotten so many good answers over the years. And mm -hmm. I think the idea, something people would say that don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff or things like that. Just anything that... Uh, it kind of ties into something I read recently about worry. And I don't know how they did this survey, but they did a survey about people that worried. And it turns out that 90% of what people worry about never happens. Yeah. So they extended, extended all this, or spent uh, rather, I should say, all this energy in something that never even happens and, and put all this brain power or loss of sleep or whatever it might be. So 
anyway, but well, listen, again, thank you so much, Jane. And as we wrap up, let me remind people of a couple other things too. My, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time or Pacific Daylight Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Uh, please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. As I said earlier, always appreciate that. And I know people are struggling with a lot of life issues, and I come across this in my speaking and coaching and workshops and so forth, anxiety, depression, jobs, health issues, family issues, financial issues. And I have a gratitude coaching program that I'm very proud of that can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. And it does dramatically shorten your learning curve and gets a derailed life back on track. So I offer a complimentary 30-minute coaching consultation to offer you some on-the-spot coaching and see if I might be able to help. So if you'd like to schedule your 30-minute consultation, text the word COACH, C-O-A-C-H, to my text number, 206-371-8309, and I will send you back a scheduler link, and we'll get that done. So also, if people like to receive my weekly Monday Morning Minute, that's very popular, and that goes out every Monday morning, a 60-second video on a different topic on gratitude each week. And if you'd like to get that, go to your text and text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And in the message box, put in gratitude guy, all one word, and you hit send and it'll give you a link to put your email in and you will get that. So lastly, thank you so much for tuning in. I always appreciate the audience, both on YouTube and on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. And remember, this is that gratitude guy. Be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.